Okay, so um, good evening. My name is Alessandra Moctezuma, and I'm the gallery director and professor of museum studies here at San Diego Mesa College. Thank you so much for coming and joining us in this cold night. It at least wasn't raining, so that's good. Um, I was very excited about this exhibition, the first one of, our, of the semester. Um, I, um, I've known uh, Larry Cavini and Silfredo for several years. And, um, and more recently, I got to see the sculptures by Chris War. And I just getting to know their artwork and their process, um, I imagined in my head how uh, well they would bounce off each other and how beautifully they would come together in, uh, in a gallery space. Um, I titled the exhibition Dynamic Gestures because when you go into that gallery right now, it feels very animated, it feels full of energy and life, and uh, that's what I enjoyed about this artist's works. Um, also, I kept seeing connections between the different artists, um, both uh, Larry Cavini and um, Silfredo Lao have a gestural quality to the way they paint. Um, they also have a performative aspect of their work, and each of them will talk about that um, when they uh, present some of their pieces and elaborate on that. Um, I also saw the similarities between, uh, for example, Chris War and his treatment of faces, his kind of deconstruction of the faces, his appropriation of found materials in constructing them, and some of the ways that uh, Larry Cavini also disintegrates and kind of evaporates the face through his brush strokes. So I, th I thought that um, it was lyrically they would connect with each other very well. And, um, and then there's also a comedic aspect, I think, to both, you know, in the videos of, by uh, Chris War and, and, and also in Larry's, there's that aspect of kind of breaking out down the preciousness and both use the idea of, of, of the uh, male figure, you know, Chris is more self-portraits, but, um, and Chris is more cubistic in nature, uh, but I just like the way that both of them also bounced off each other. So, um, so I think um, from what I've heard, you know, people really enjoyed the energy in this exhibit. I'm not going to talk too much longer about that. Uh, I'll let the artists speak for themselves and show you some examples of their other works. And um, I just want to thank um, Pat Vine, the, our, our wonderful gallery coordinator. She's just so great and making sure that our exhibits run smoothly, our receptions um, are well stuck with wonderful food, and, um, and that our students have somebody working with them. I want to thank my museum studies class for all their hard work. I just get them in, the, in that space. On Monday, I just put Janine and Andrew and uh, Nicole in that space, and I told them, you, I, I'm going to teach you how to do the lighting, and you got to do it. And so they just um, took it up on themselves, and they finished the job. So I'm very proud of them. I'm very happy. And I want to um, thank everybody in the art department for bringing their students. And so first of all, I'm going to um, introduce Silfredo Lao. Uh, he's originally from Cuba. He's a, a dancer. Um, you know, he's uh, spent his whole life in dance, uh, knows many different types of dance, and he teaches at uh, Palomar College, uh, but he's also a wonderful painter. So he's going to, to go first, and um, what we'll do is maybe I'll just do a brief introduction for each artist, and at the end, we'll have a Q&A where, where you guys can ask them uh, questions about their work. So Silfredo, you can yes. come over here. Thank you. Okay. Hello, guys. I'll bring this up, but it's paused. And when you're ready, you let me know, and we'll okay. start. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, yes, my name, uh, uh, my name is Silfredo Lao. I'm from Cuba. I've been here in this country uh, 13 years. I've been dancing all my life. I studied dance in Cuba in the National School of Art for seven years. And painting was always my hobby. It was always something that I did no matter what. You know what I mean? um, but I never thought that today I was just doing this presentation here. So thank you, Alessandra. Uh, before I start talking to you, I want to show you a video that it is the way I'm painting today. Yeah. I'm combining 
my 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 dance background with my expression um it is what it is so i show you this yeah, yeah. I was not, I mean, I didn't want to take my chair off in the video, but the guy told me oh, that would be good. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I took my chair off. As you see, guys, you know what I mean? Uh, for me, dancing and painting, music, anything, just an expression. You know what I mean? Um, I grew up in a family where everybody was a dancer, everybody was a a painter and everybody was a, a musician, but they still don't know it. They still don't know it, they have that quality. But I guess I was the only one in my family who, who walked that particular uh, uh, road and I became an artist. But every time I go to Cuba and I, saw, I see my, my, my mom and I see my father and my brothers, we always play music, we always painting, and we always dancing, always. And I said to myself, ah, that's where I come from. That's where uh, my painting come from. This is where my dancing feeling come from. And I'm really glad that, that I grew up in the way I grew up in my fam with my family. And it shaped me uh, and taught me a lot of uh, who I am today. So now, talking about the process of my art, at the beginning of, uh, like I said, I uh, started dancing. Uh, at the age of 13, at the national school, I graduated from the school, and, and like I said, painting was just a hobby. We were just painting every day. It was not something that I loved to do. It was not about loving painting. It was something that I had to do. You know what I mean? It's like sometimes you just have to do it. You just have to draw something. You have to paint something. It's not about love being something. It's about your brain doesn't work in a different way. Your brain is telling you to paint and to do this. And that's, that was me. Every time in the classroom, I would not pay attention to anything. I was just drawing something. But uh, I became a dancer. I became a dancer, yes. Uh, in Cuba, we have a system that the, 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 the art school, they go to different school and they, they test you. They, and they go to a classroom and say, OK, we are going to have a test for, for music and you have a test. We are going to have a test for visual art, and you do have your test. And we are going to have a test for dancing, or theater, or ballet. And you test yourself. If you pass your test, you can go freely to the dance school, or to the art school, or to the theater school. You don't have to pay for anything. Everything is free. But you have to have the talent. You have to have the, 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 the ability to do that, because the government is paying for that. Uh, I did both, I did two tests. I did the, the, the visual art test and I did the dance test. I didn't pass the visual art test. I was, <laughs> man, I was just like, <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. I was just like devastated. You know what I mean? Like uh, art was something that was my breakthrough and, 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 and I didn't pass. But I did pass the dance test. I did pass the dance test. They saw something on me. I don't know. So I went to dance school and I became a professional dancer. You know what I mean? I started shaping my body and taking my ballet classes and everything. And <laughs> I started getting to know a different form of expressing, like using your body to express yourself. You know what I mean? Like, like with a technique, with a proper technique, you can do a bunch of things like, uh, as an athlete. 
but you have the opportunity of expressing yourself. You want to say something, you can express with your body. Your body is a pencil, your body is a brush. Of course, at that moment, I was not thinking about painting. At that moment, I was just thinking about dancing, I'm dancing, I'm dancing, I'm dancing, I'm dancing, until I became a professional dancer. I graduated from the school. I went to a company in Santiago de Cuba, where I come from. I started dancing with a company. Painting was gone. And I didn't remember that I was a painter whatsoever. I mean, so many years passed, and, and dancing was just my major thing. When I moved to the United States, for the first time, I saw uh, just driving. I saw a, I didn't speak any English, but I saw art store. Just like art store. <laughs> we park, and I went there. I was crazy. I started just buying material, you know what I mean? Brushes, blah, blah, blah. Went to my house, I, I opened my first studio in my house. I clean a room, and I opened a first studio. Start painting, and painting, and painting, and painting, painting, and soon enough, all the wall in my house, just, they were full of paintings, small paintings, big paintings, da, da, da. And I was still dancing professionally with a company in San Francisco, ODC company, company that pay well, give you medical insurance and everything, you know. And I was really committed to my company. And when my son was born, I couldn't travel anymore. I couldn't go to any state with this company, or any country with this company, because I have a son. And I stopped dancing. I, and I decided to myself, you know what? I, I, talked, to a, I, I talked to somebody about how, how I can make painting my, 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 my business, you know what I mean? I was just like, like, you know what? I want to do this, you know? Um, but I couldn't, I couldn't put the price of my paintings. I couldn't, I couldn't sell my paintings. I couldn't just, I, I, I'd rather just give it to you. That somebody came to my house and I give it to you for a gift. You like it, just take it. You like it, just take it. That, that was enough for me, but I couldn't accept any money. Um, but this person helped me a lot to understand that if you want to make a business about painting, so you have to learn the business part. So start learning the things and I moved to San Diego and for the first time I opened my own studio. I couldn't afford it, but I said, you know what? Uh, I had to pay for this. I had to pay for this. I'm not selling any painting, but I need to sell it. I need, I need to pay for this and, and, and that's what I'm doing. I always, I always, as a dancer, you have a process of creation. You have a process of creating something. You need to, I understood that, understood the way of how you, how you can project something on the stage for the public, how you use the stage, how you use the light, how you use the levels on the stage, how you use your body as a, as a and I understood that very well, but I never used it on painting. I was just like, 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 like painting was something with my brush and thing around. And one day I decided yes, to do something different. Every time in my studio, every time that I'm, 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 I'm painting, I need, to, I need to stretch. I need to have like a 10, 15 minute, 20 minute, just a stretch. Just go there, I stretch myself, ba, ba, ba. I dance a little bit, ba, ba, ba. I dance, I sweat, da, da, da. I keep painting. And that date, uh, I decided to do something different. I decided yes to, I said, why, why I, don't, I don't paint when I'm dancing? You know what I mean? Why I don't combine those things when I'm dancing? Um, I just put the canvas on the floor, and like I said, like you see in the video, I just suck my, my, my sucks <laughs> on paintings. And I start moving. I start moving just freely, just creating something. I want to walk here. And, uh, you say something. Tell me something. Whatever. You know what I mean? And what I notice that every time that I do something, doesn't matter what I do with my body on top, every time that I stop somewhere, I create like a really, really... Uh, and a structure that was just not, not wrong. It was just like when you step, you step all the time the same distance. I mean, you don't step, you step in the same. So when you make a circle, when you step, when you jump, and you go here, and you walk forward, you create a certain distance on, on the canvas that it look, I mean, it doesn't look, it look balanced. You know what I mean? It creates a balance on the canvas. So I noticed that, and uh, yeah, I was okay with this. My feet, now I can do this, it looks good. Well, what about my upper body? My upper body is like, 
is the one that's going to be talking to the public, but also I need to say something on the, on the canvas. And it took me a while. It took me a while to really discover the thing. It took me practice and practice and practice and practice and practice and practice to really master, I'm still mastering the things, to really get really comfortable with that. And, and changing material, acrylic help a lot. With oil, I start with oil, I don't do it with oil. No, not at all, it doesn't work. And, and, and acrylic really give me that, that, that texture thing and that freedom of expression. I was just like, that's the material I'm going to be using for now. It dry fast, you can take it off from, 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 from your body really quickly, you know what I mean? And I start using, I start using acrylic. And I started just creating a bunch of painting that way, just pressing myself. Ah, la, 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 la. I didn't care what it was on the bottom of the painting. I was just pressing myself freely, not thinking whatsoever of my body was just talking at the moment. I was not thinking, I want, I want to talk about something. No, no, no. I'm talking now about what it is. And tomorrow will be something completely different. I never, never try myself to, to hold myself back and and why I like this painting, I'm not going to step over. Never, never I did that. I, until today, I have this, 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 I said to myself that I will stop being a painter the day I do that. The day I say, oh, I like this, I'm not going to touch it. No, I will touch it. <laughs> and I don't care if I, if I mess it up. If I mess it up, something good will come from, 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 from the next one. Yes, a challenge. Yes, yes something that I cannot, I cannot, Tell to myself, that's enough. That's not enough. That's not for me. That's it's not enough. And st until today, I'm still struggling with that, with that feeling. Every, t every, every single time I create a painting, I don't want to repeat the same painting again. I want to create something new. So right now, I'm just having the same, the same conflict of what my next show will be. So I don't know. But, uh, but it's a challenge, and, and that's the way I create my work. I just combine the thing. It doesn't mean that I'm going to be continuously doing that. As a matter of fact, I don't want to do it anymore. I want to do something different. And, and, but at the same time, believe that it's not quite, quite, I, I, I still believe that I can, I, can, I can express myself a little bit more in that direction, and maybe little by little just finding something else. But, uh, and I was talking to a lady too today, to this lady here, that uh, sometimes I was struggling. I'm a new painter. I'm not, I'm not somebody that well know, that make a big statement in Europe and everybody's just listening here. No, I don't, I don't, I, as a painter, I was just like, 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 like you know what? I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't have to, to say anything. I don't have to say in a statement to anybody. I need yet to, be comfortable with myself, with what I'm going to say to myself. And if it's somebody on the painting, uh, see the painting, uh, they have something that really motivated them to do something, great. But I never walk in a way that, okay, I'm going to say a statement or something. The f that's me. And the first thing I need to do is thinking about myself. What, 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 what is in my mind at the moment, not thinking about somebody else? What is in my mind right now? And just feel comfortable with my mind. Feel comfortable with myself and be able to express myself the way it is, and that's me. And if it, the painting becomes something that is an statement, great. If it's not, it's great too, you know? Somebody will, will, will get touched, and if one person gets touched by the painting, that's enough for me too, you know what I mean? It's not like, 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 it's not right if we are not saying something about how the country is going today or how people is treating people today. It's not right if I'm not, I'm not doing art if, it's, if, if I'm not saying something. You know what? I'm saying something. I'm saying something to myself because I'm the first, I'm the first I need to be saying something to myself in order to change something. I need to change myself first in order to change somebody else. So. And she was told by the painting. She was just like, like, like talking about to me about how she got connected with the painting. I, I was really happy to hear her story. And, and I will, I said, well, you know what? I will mention that on my, on my, on my talking tonight. That 
I used to get stuck on that particular thought. Okay, I want to paint something. Hmm, I will paint something about, yes, why not, yes, da, 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 da. And I, I did try, and nothing came up. Because I, I, I was not connected with anything. So as soon as I start connecting with myself, everything starts just flowing. And you, just can, you can just drive whatever you want when you are connected with yourself. And the connection that I found with myself was really spiritually. It was really, really, as you see there on the, on the, on the video, I'm dancing with a soul. I'm dancing with a soul because this, this, this particular God that we call it in Cuba, it's, it's the God that dances with a soul, we call it Ogun. And Ogun is the energy that, is the energy that make people do things. It's the make, make people fight. Make, it's the energy that is related to technology, related to, 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 to uh, aggression, but also create destruction and creation. It's the energy that always make you wake up in the morning. It's the energy that always make, do something. And I, I use that as an example of what you say, you know what? I want to do so good because I want to, I want to do something different. I want to just express myself and by using this energy, by using this, this, by connecting myself with my spirituality, connecting myself with my root, is what you see today in the paintings. It's what you see today in the gallery. It's nothing else. It's not a statement about anything. It's just a connection between me and, and my work. And, and if he, somebody, like this lady tonight, get connected with the painting, you can ask me any question, you know what I mean? Or, or whatever you feel with the painting, you know what I mean? I feel this and I feel this and I feel this and, and that's great, you know what I mean? But I never try to really, today, to make an statement. I really try not to, to make an statement about anything. That's me today. Maybe tomorrow you will see me, my painting, you will see like a I don't know, something like, oh, he's making a statement. But what I mean, but I mean, it's like, it's, I, 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 I pass that rule that we're just like really stuck, really stuck. I'm not making art if I don't make it a statement. I'm not making art if I'm not making a statement. And I found out that's not true. I found out that art is something that is really deeply on you and, and it's an expression. And you need to start first on yourself and then to anybody else. Um, that's it. If you have any questions, guys, I'm going to be ending now. You can ask me later. <laughs> cool? <laughs> so next, we're going to have um, this uh, Chris War, who's the sculptor. Um, I really loved his work, and specifically, I was seeing the relationship between his faces, his figures, and the work of Larry Cavini, but I also was seeing the energy that, you know, Silfredo was talking about, you know, something that uh, reflected a passion uh, for this idea of, you know, the portrait. And um, Chris also talked about the importance of looking at portraiture and sculptural uh, pieces, faces, heads from other artists and other cultures. And so I was fascinated by that. Um, Chris, Chris studied at San Diego State and um, it's a place that many of your, your students might transfer to, so I also um, thought that it would be interesting to hear him talk about his uh, progression as an artist and, um, and some of his inspiration and his work. So here's Chris. Thank you. Hi, Mom. Well, I was gonna start with like an even earlier piece this is like something I did just coming out of high school. Um, I think, actually, like I, I heard somebody say one time, that one of the rules of giving an artist lecture was never show anything before uh, undergrad. And so I'm definitely breaking that rule. But I think that there's a good reason for it. Um, and because uh, I think most of you guys are here in, are in community college, right? Or you, most of you guys are students here. Um, and also, well, I wish I had the first slide, because actually, I, today I scanned all these sketches. I found my high school sketchbook, and I scanned all these sketches. 
that I did, and they were like weird, like dragon like creatures and like comic book characters that I'd made up and like uh, things that look like far side cartoons and stuff. And so I thought it was cool to reference some of the things that I looked at and that I think influences the work that I that I do now. But uh, we don't have it, so you just have to imagine it. And they're really amazing um, if you could picture them. Uh, so, and then this is like a painting that I did. So like, as I was going through high school, I started to paint and I was taking painting lessons and stuff. And I was really into surfing and I don't do surf art anymore, but it's still like a really big part of my life. And I like to think that it's, it informs my practice in some way. Um, I don't really know exactly how that is, but, uh, um, but it was important to me at one point. And then, we get into this stuff, this is like, portraiture has always been really important to me. And that was uh, one of the sketches that I had scanned from high school was, was a portrait. And this is a self-portrait. Um, Self-portraiture has also been very important to me. But I'm really interested in, in the, the language of, of portraiture. And what I mean by that is, is sort of the... Um, Throughout our history, there's been all these different styles and techniques that have that have developed, and um, look, as a, it, when I was young, I was unaware of those things, but they were kind of coming to me through the filter of like popular culture. So like through looking at like comics and cartoons, like Warner Brothers cartoons, and uh, you know Gary Larson's Far Side and uh, Calvin and Hobbes, um, I, all those things were sort of like, were kind of teaching me about our history I didn't really know. And then once I went to school, I kind of like realized where some of those things were coming from. But anyways, so I was doing, uh, you know, straight up painting, right, in col uh, when I first started college. This is like the kind of, and I loved drawing old people. And uh, I really liked, it's funny, because like I really liked drawing old people. And when I was a kid, I was like, when I was drawing in, in high school, um, the sketches, I noticed there was like all these villains. Like I really liked the villains because they were like, they're evil. Like they had like the slanted eyes and like these, they had more expression in their face. And there was something that it, I, I felt like those, those images penetrated um, a little deeper than, than like the good guys, which uh, with like the big square jaws and, and like the G.I. Joe looking people. Um, and then, okay, so then going into, this, this is transferring into San Diego State, um, which I guess some of you might be doing, as Alessandro said. Um, and uh, at that point, then I kind of learned, like, I started to learn about art history, and I learned, like, oh, well, like, the figure's been done all these different ways, and, um, you know, in some ways I thought, like, well, the figure is kind of dead, and it's really kind of a dumb thing to be doing. I just felt kind of dumb to do it, and... Um, and so I started to get away from that, and I, but I couldn't get away from like the sort of uh, creature-like forms, and uh, this thing looks like an intestine or in a colon or something, and uh, so that was still there. I was trying to make like objects that were still, I didn't, I didn't really realize what I was doing, but looking back, I was trying to make objects that related to the body, and this is another one. It's another one. It's kind of like a big steel thing, and it's like a stomach, sort of. I, I mean, it's unintentional, but it's totally there. Okay, then um, I graduated, and um, actually, one of the things I want to talk about is is getting out of school. It's not just going into a new school. Um, you know, it's uh, it's getting out, and uh, that's a really difficult transition. I mean, it'll be. You know, if you're going to go from here to another four-year college, that'll be a great transition. You're going to learn a lot. It'll be different, um, for sure, but you're still going to have that context to create work within, and you're still going to have basically a deadline that's set for you by a professor, and you're going to have a group of peers around you that are always going to be there to talk about your artwork. Um, but when you get out, you don't have any of that shit. You're kind of like on your own. And you might have some friends, and hopefully you guys will band together and make work. But uh, you know, you'll kind of realize like, oh, well, where am I going to make this work? And um, 
who am I going to talk about it with? And who's going to make me finish this thing? Why am I going to finish it? So you're going to need to sort of uh, manifest some of those things for yourself. And so this is my first studio. I got out, I lucked out, I got out and I, I was out for a few months and there was this, a great like live work studio and I just lucked out and I got it. And then I was, I, I mean, it was really strange to get out of school and especially in San Diego, there's not a huge art scene here. And um, I didn't really know what to do. There was no galleries really. And um, so I just decided that I, no matter what, I was gonna make a lot of art. And, and that's what I did. And then I started to, I started to like seek out other people. And I made friends, this is more shots of my studio. This is, my studio always kind of looks like this. Um, and I made friends with somebody and um, we started to collaborate. And then we collaborated for like two years and we made everything together. Um, and we were like, it's funny if you like go back, like this is like this dark, like whatever, you know, this dark object stuff, you know, that's like, kind of oozing and um, and then I went bam into this you know and I think I was like getting out of school and I was starting to like look at a lot of art around and and I really wanted to I really was in love with the figure and and I felt dumb about that in school and then I got out of school and I was just like fuck it man this is what I want to do and my friend was the same way he was like he was like yeah this is cool and so we started to make stuff like this that was really goofy because we thought that, I mean, being in school and feeling like, like the figure was, was dumb or, or goofy made me sort of like push that into a really kind of, uh, I guess, kind of a, a silly area. And I think that this stuff is pretty like, uh, it's like cartoonish, but it's also like um, nihilistic in a way. You know, um, I, it was, it was like really bright and really colorful, but I also saw it as somewhat of a middle finger. Um, and it was like a middle finger to banality. It was a middle finger to like what I saw as like, as tradition. Maybe it was a middle finger to, to art school. I mean, not really, but I, I mean, you know, I just was young and, and I was kind of a punk, so. Um, <laughs> Uh, this is another one. I mean, it was just kind of like, you know, the weirder we could get, the the better we felt about it. Um, and we used, you know, we started using, when I was in school, the other thing I was doing is I was buying, I, I was doing found object art, but I was like spending a shitload of money on it. I was like going to these um, these surplus places and just buying stuff that I thought looked cool and then like not, you know, using very little of it. And so I was... I was poor and when I got out of school and then I, I was like, well, I was like, I'm just going to make art with whatever the hell is lying around. And that's exactly what we did. I mean, we got, we found these, like, we found chairs in the dumpster and we, we'd get couches that people left out and we'd cut them open and take the stuffing out and then we'd make these big stuff sculptures, um, you know, clay and plaster that people gave us, just, you know, random bits of plastic, um, and stuff that like we would also go into the back of thrift stores where people would do the, the drop-offs and we would just grab a bunch of junk. I mean, that's probably not a good thing, but yeah. <laughs> we used it for a good cause. Uh, this is another figure here. Um, and so, yeah, this, this one is like my favorite. This was like the first one that we made together. And we made this thing and I had made that head like a year before and we found that cushion. That's one of those like cushions that you lay back into. And we found that and, and then we found these boots like on the side of the trolley tracks and we painted the bottom orange and we put it, we had this AstroTurf. And uh, like, we just put that together and we were, I mean, you know, looking back, maybe we were a little too awestruck with ourselves, but we were like, oh my God, this is amazing. No one's ever done this before. <laughs> but that's a really good feeling to have and you totally, I mean, if you have that feeling, I think you should totally pursue it because it made us make a lot of work and we thought, um, I mean, we just didn't, hadn't really seen much like that before. And we, and I mean, 
we didn't know that we were sort of in a way riding this kind of this kind of trend that was happening where there was a lot of like really bright colorful kind of silly work going on it's kind of like a uh, I don't know how many of you guys have studied our history but if you know of the Dada period it's a period in like the uh, Oh man, I better know this. It's like in the 20s through the 30s, I think. Uh, but anyways, early 1900s, um, and uh, it was sort of it was kind of like it was kind of nihilism, and it was it was political in a way. They they weren't making direct political commentary because they couldn't, but they were like they were just like well, their their idea was like basically the government doesn't make any sense, so we're not going to make any sense, and they wrote these poems that were just nonsense. And the the art was kind of nonsense, and um, and so it was like it was kind of a deconstruction in a way, and so we were we, we kind of learned later that there was a bunch of that going on. Um, this is you know shopping cart with bottles and stuff, and but we were also like really interested in in beauty, you know, um, and uh, yeah yeah these are beautiful, you know. Who's laughing at that? Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, um, the, they're, they're ugly, but they're ugly through a certain lens in it. And I think that, that, that is, that's where like, uh, cartoon language and comic book language starts to fit in this kind of caricature of like, of ugliness or grittiness. This is an installation shot of a show that we did. This is our last show, um, that we did together. Um, and this was a crazy show. I didn't really like this show. This was like towards the end, and we, and we were sick of each other by this point. And we just were making so much work, and it was, you know, I think at a certain point, you can kind of like, I mean, we, we, we thought we didn't care about anything, and uh, we were just trying to be really goofy, and that was good for a while, and then I realized like, there was something missing. Like there was kind of a seriousness that was missing after a while. And I think it was there in the beginning, but then towards the end, we were trying to manufacture this thing that we had. And um, I don't know, a lot of people like the show. I don't like it. And then I made this piece. And uh, this piece was kind of a statement. This is the first piece that I made on my own again. And there was a, at the time, like a bunch of people in my studio. It wasn't very big. It was like 800 square feet. And there was like <clears throat> sometimes like f like four people that I would let work in there, and I was paying the rent on this place. Sometimes I would come home and there would be like people hanging out in my like partying in my place, and I'd be like, "What the hell?" But um, but you know, it was it was kind of it was great to me. Like going back to what I said before about creating that context, it was great because I had like w like because I could offer space to people. Um, I had a community of, of artists around me, and we would we would talk and we'd feed off of each other's energy, um, and that was really good uh, until like it just got crazy, and we were all up in each other's shit basically. And um, this piece, I you know I I felt towards the end like I was sacrificing a lot because I was paying the rent and I was working hard and I was poor and whatever, and so I made this piece and I made it as big as I could. I made it like it was it was an inch from the ceiling and it was just like one singular figure you know like this and it was like kind of the statement and um, I wanted it to be I, I don't know I wasn't thinking about this at the time but looking back this is what I think was going on I think I was trying to like claim my territory in a way and um, uh, yeah I think it did that I did this in, that in a weird way because it's very it's imposing but it's also um, it's also like kind of frightened itself, and uh, it's also weak, and um, it doesn't have any genitalia, and it doesn't have any arms, um, and so I, I think that uh, there's there's just a, there's kind of a, a weird duality going on, and I think that that speaks to a kind of truth about humanity, and then then I went on to start making just started making more of my own stuff again, like the color starts to go away. A little bit, and uh, they're a little bit darker. Um, and then uh, I started to make videos. Um, basically, this is a this is a still from the one of the videos that's in the show. I think this one's in the show, right? Yeah. Um, 
So I, uh, yeah, I think, you know, the thing that got me into making video was that uh, when you're making a painting or a sculpture, you sort of like, you, you put all this time into a sort of this singular object and then you put it on display and people walk up to it and they're like, they look at it for like, t like 10 seconds and then they're like, oh, that's good, you know, and they walk off. But when, when, when someone watches a film or they watch a performance, they sit there with their undivided attention for like two hours. Um, and so I was sort of jealous of that and I had done some performance work uh, in the past and um, I liked that, that feeling, so I wondered if if I could, with, with video, if I could play with, with attention span, I guess, was my original impetus for it. Or like if I could play with the idea of, of film versus painting. And I didn't want somebody to, to go up and stare at this thing and watch it all the way through for two hours like a movie. But I did want to create something that would let, let make someone linger a little bit longer and then hopefully move on and then come back to it. Um, the other thing that I was seeing was that the, a lot of the video work that I was experiencing at the time was like way too long for me. Like, it, like there was someone would have like a 20 minute video in a show and it wouldn't even be that good. But, but the fact that, you know when you're like watching uh, TV, you're watching like a really bad show and you're, and it's like, you don't know why you're watching it, but you're still there and you can't stop until, until the end. That's what I felt about, like, yeah. about video art and I didn't want to make, I wanted people to feel comfortable about, about, about moving on. And um, so I guess I was thinking a lot about the viewer and myself as a viewer. And so I started and I was like, well, what am I going to do? I'm going to do a self-portrait because, uh, I mean, I'm a total narcissist. And uh, <laughs> so uh, I did that and I started to, I really didn't know anything about uh, uh, video editing. I got a program and I just started to click buttons. Like literally, I started to just click on things and see what happened. And eventually, I kind of like figured out a couple little things I could do. And um, I still knew basically nothing. I didn't even know if I could repeat some of the things that I did. Um, and it was really, you know, they're really hokey tricks. You know, they're just like these little holes that I'm cutting and I'm layering. I learned that I could layer video and then I was like oh that's cool like you can you can put video on top of video and then cut holes through it and, and the other thing can be behind it so uh, that's when I started to I did this one first and then I did a whole series of other videos um, like a year later I did a whole bunch with myself and then um, this one here this one's like this one is a uh, is like a 15 minute long video um, and it starts with like this big scene and then it zooms into to this sort of portrait on the chair and then it zooms into the head and it ends and um, uh, I think there, oh yeah there's the there's the beginning kind of image there's kind of all these things going on um, and then and so I was pushing all the time with these videos pushing the idea of like of how long somebody would would stay and, and stay and watch it. And I don't think I ever really found a way to control it. it and it didn't really matter. It was just a way for me, something for me to think about as I put together like a flow um, and, uh, and thought about, I guess, working with, with time as a medium. Am I ready to stop talking? Yeah, that's enough about videos. I made a bunch of videos. Um, I think there, some of them are pretty good. So then, um, yeah, so this is, uh, this is space for art, um, and this is not my artwork, but uh, I, I, was, I feel like I should probably talk about this because, um, uh, because it's something that's been really important to me and something that I've put a lot of energy into over the last three years. So like, I guess around the same time as I was making those videos, and uh, I was kind of I wasn't making work all that much. I was kind of like wondering why the hell I was making work in the first place and uh, thinking that I should probably get out of San Diego and go somewhere that had a better art scene. And, but then at the same time, there had always been, um, I guess it's like 
all my friends and I had always talked about like, oh, we've got to do something in San Diego. We've got to do something here, you know? Um, it's this place is like, it's so ripe for something cool to happen. And what I learned was that, that there was cool stuff happening, but it was always like underneath some kind of rock. You know, there was always, there was something cool happening and 10 people knew about it and nobody else knew about it. And then like, you know, you, you go meet and you're like, holy, holy crap, this is really cool. And you go over here and you, and you meet another group of people and you're like, this is really cool too. But nobody is, uh, is like coming together. There's no cohesion. So anyways, I got involved with a group um, of people and I was on a committee called uh, Space for Art. Um, and uh, the idea was to build an affordable artist's work live space. So to build affordable housing basically for artists. And I had a studio, like I had a, a, like a subsidized, you know, it was like section eight housing. And it was actually, it just happened to be a perfect studio and it was subsidized. Um, and so I kind of had that deal. I mean, I was still barely able to pay my rent, but I was able to do it and I was able to make work all the time. And I was like, this is great, but there's nobody else that, ha I mean, that, that really has this deal. Like no one else my age that has like a studio like this and, and, uh, and for this cheap and more people should have this. So I kind of got in, it, um, I got interested in this group and, um, we, we started doing um, what they call like these brainstorming sessions and whatever. I won't get too into this because this is like a this is like a whole two hour presentation in itself. But like, anyways, flash forward to the future, we end up finding a space and um, and we are. It's not a permanent space because we kind of realize like, oh, we're not going to be able to secure this. The, a permanent space for another five to six years or whatever, you know, 10 years to a lifetime, who knows. But we can rent a space in the meantime and we can divide it up and we can basically have this artist complex and, and then we can continue, while we have that complex, we can work towards something uh, more permanent. And so this is, the, is one of the buildings in the space that, that we've leased and it's a big warehouse space. We've divided it into many different studios, about 35. Um, and there's five of them are, are live work, and then a bunch of them are just working studios. And we have a gallery um, and a classroom and a wood shop and all these uh, great facilities. There is, uh, that's Bob, our fearless leader. Um, and uh, he is a construction genius and an architect. And uh, um, he's, telling somebody what to do there. He likes to do that. And then this is the, uh, these are like live workspaces. And this is going back to, I'm trying to re, kind of reconnect to like the original finding my, my studio space. Because all this is interconnected. I'm, I'm not trying to like lump in something. Uh, but this is a really important part of, I think, my career in, in realizing who I am as an artist is realizing that I need a community around me um, I need to be alone sometimes to make work. I've realized that, but uh, uh, but but having energy in around you and having a place for your work to go um, is is super important because otherwise you can just basically end up spinning your wheels. Um, so these we built out all our spaces and uh, now we live there. And uh, yeah, this is during the construction process here. Anyways. That's my loft, actually. That's where I sleep. <laughs> sleep right back there. And then, um, yeah, so we, we do events. Um, and we get lots of people out to our openings. Um, it tends to bring together many different aspects of the San Diego community, which is great. I think we can probably do a better job. But um, uh, yeah, it's been a really good thing for my career because, or I shouldn't really say career because I'm not making any money off of this, but uh, but it's been a good thing for my work. Uh, although I thought it wasn't for like two years, this thing like killed me. I didn't really make much of anything, but um, the thing was is I wasn't making much before. In all honesty, I was kind of like losing steam and probably needing to go somewhere else. But uh, because we built the space and we and 
and we uh, we got some cohesion and artists came together and there was an exchange of ideas and we've made connections to other places um, I've been able to make work again oh yeah here's the here's a picture of our gallery when it's all finished um, and uh, that's a different show it's a pretty it's a nice space you guys should you guys should check it out for Is sure that his village? yeah yeah it's it's in the East Village area like <laughs> Right yeah, um, and then so flash forward. This is uh, some of the work that I've been making over the the, the period that I've been there, um, and it's again, it's kind of it's going back to uh, portraiture, a lot of it, um, and now it's kind of going back and taking a look um, at different aspects. I think of uh, I guess the language of of portraiture and the language of facial expression. Um, I think uh, it's kind of, I think a lot of it's sort of uh, self-explanatory, but um, I think, I don't know. Yeah, this is new, this is all fresh stuff. I don't know what to say about it. But I think it's really, um, I think it's, it, it is still really tied, it has its roots in, um, in my youth where there is a real interest in in cartoon language and um, and comic books and and comic strips and things of that nature and then it's sort of like layered with this patina of art history as I've gone through art school and learned where a lot of those things came from um, I, I mean and actually I think it's like one of my first like fine artist influences was was Van Gogh and I think that a lot of this like impressionism it's like a lot of what I go for in these is to try to make an impressionist sculpture, you know, is that these sort of forms kind of like, I feel like in a way, like they emulate almost a brush stroke. Like this one begins to have it on the on the head and the, the brush strokes are, or the, sorry, the, this, the, the planes are, are sculptural in a way that to me at least reflect painting. This one does for sure uh, this one reminds me of an impressionistic painting. And that's it. That's all of them. Thank you, Chris. So, you know, you see, when you see the artists talking, you see the connections that I was kind of thinking about as I invited all of them to come. And ob it's obvious, I think, for all of them, and I think that's really good for you guys, the passion that all of them have for their work and, and how you know, so it's such a personal and important thing in their life. And I really like your metaphor about you know, San Diego as being kind of disjointed with all these things happening in all these different places. And being here 11 years and teaching here, I've been looking under all those rocks and what I've been trying to do is connect all this, you know, a lot of these things together. And that's why my students in my museum studies class have gone to do a show at Space for Art, and they have gone to do a show at Art Produce, and they're doing do the show at the garage. Because I'm trying to kind of bring all of these things together and show them that there's lots of things to see here and, and lots of um, people to learn from and to, to connect with. Um, so our next uh, speaker is Larry Cavini. And um, I've invited here, him here before to talk about his garage project, which was an exhibition space that he had at his home in, um, in Hillcrest. And um, I really loved his passion for uh, promoting the work of other artists, not only you know creating his own pieces, but also promoting the work of other artists. Um, he actually very graciously invited our class to do an exhibition there last semester. Um, and uh, it was very successful. Um, I really like uh, the um, fact that Larry is also commenting on this idea of, you know, kind of, in a way, maybe Chris is doing it too, rebelling again the, against the preciousness of the art world. You know, if you see, uh, I, Chris, I'm thinking of some of your pedestals that are, you know, it's not about this precious, pristine white block that you put the pa painting on top, but it's this, this thing that it's coming to life and it's made out of found objects. And I think also with Larry's work, we, we chose to just pin, pin his pieces up to the wall, unframed, and, um, and he has a gallery, but he also is going to talk to you about other ways that he gets his work out there and challenges those notions of kind of the art world and the art gallery. And, the representation. So 
So here's Larry Cavini. Yeah, you know, I, I'm really enjoying the company of the, the other two artists and hearing their, you know, testimony about their work and everything. And, and just thinking about, you know, the common denominator within a lot of things in respect of, you know, our first speaker within his performative actions, making art, with his abstract paintings. I love the text in his work. You know, I've used text in my work before. And in the idea also, uh, the, the second artist talking about sculpture and, uh, you know, and the idea of portraiture is a great idea, I think, in respect of, uh, you know, a reflection of people we know or maybe a residue of people we might have known once upon a time. Let me see, make sure I get this here. Anyway, I'll go here. For me, um, my... I guess making art for me was the initiation of making art. You know, it was the, the idea of like doing something outside of thinking about making money. I was pretty much born in a fairly poor kind of environment, North Carolina. And, uh, and you know, the initiate, in a lot of ways, it was the idea of comic books. A lot of you guys probably read comic books, right? right? And the idea of Marvel comics and DC comics. and Looking at superheroes, and you know, looking at the idea of uh, superheroes as a way of communicating something, you know, beyond ourselves, but also the idea of you know using the figure, because for us, for the most part, the idea of the figure is what narrates language within our culture, right? You know, we look at something, and usually the initiation of a conversation is looking at the figure, and then it takes us through this narrative to the given story, you know? So a lot of that was about me and, and simulating these ideas of looking at Marvel Comics, looking at DC Comics, but also looking at these superheroes are, that were about another world, which was about escapism, another world, which kind of took me out of my poverty in a way and kept me from thinking about the lack of money. In some ways. And my mother, too, really encouraged me about drawing versus, you know, making them. She was always complimenting on the drawings versus what are the other aspects, sports or whatever, that, you know, a parent might celebrate. So that was very encouraged my mother. And, you know, through the course of time, you know, making paintings, making objects on my own in Asheville, North Carolina. You ever heard of Asheville, North Carolina? Close to the Black Mountain College. You ever heard of the Black Mountain College? You know, uh, William de Cooney used to teach there. And... We haven't gotten there yet. got there yet. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> but it was kind of a branch of the Bauhaus. And, uh, but Asheville, in its own right, you know, it kind of represented the selection of rocks you had to turn over. You know, you moved to Asheville, and you, you would see the facade of art, in a way, you know, in terms of what the tourists would see, you know, it was a more decorative idea. And then I, I ran into a collective of artists that, you know, that would meet on a regular basis on Monday nights. We'd have our boys night out and we'd talk about art and we'd go about bouncing off ideas with each other. And that was like in 1985, 1985. In some ways, that was the beginning of kind of like my formalization of making art within a, you know, a conversation with other artists, you know, bouncing off ideas. You probably had that experience as well. You know, it's good to have an audience, you know, that you could bounce off your ideas and, and see how they <coughs> see your conversation to the world in some ways. It's important to have. Otherwise, you know, you're kind of in a vacuum. You're kind of isolated in some ways. It's still satisfying, still empowering, but it's good to have that other voice going on, those other voices that maybe can inform your process within concept, but also technologies as well. You know? So that's what those guys serve for me. They were my community in a lot of ways. And for the most part, making for me was the traditional arts of like painting and sculpting. And, you know, and not being formally trained at that stage in terms of you know, going to a formal university and anything. So I'm just kind of like simulating things I see using the figure. So I'd make these kind of like 
figurative things, would talk about things in general. And they were somewhat humorous, they were funny. You know, for me, I love humor. You know, humor for me is the social lubricant of life. It gets you through a lot of things, humor. You know, the idea of, uh, there was a theorist. Henry Bergson talked about the theory of comedy. And the theory of comedy, he would make the analogy of like a baby. A baby, when it, you ever notice a baby when it initially laughs, right? You ever see a baby that laughed? Maybe at the, at the age of six months. Have you? Have you ever witnessed that? Well, you know a baby doesn't know a joke, right? It doesn't even know a, the, the, the worst knock-knock joke. It, if you tell a knock-knock joke, it'll just look at you, right? But you might be able to do something like this and just shake it at him, right? That random action that you know, make the baby laugh, maybe break their pattern or whatever. Well, Henry Bergson talked about that in terms of the, you know, the chemistry of comedy. And you know, the other thing, too, is like the idea of comedy was like ingrained in me. I enjoy comedy. It's part of me. You know? And that's one thing you should think about is what is the organic part of you that's unique to you? It's good to simulate. You know, it's good to look at other ideas and, and within the spirit of the copyist and copy other ideas. For me, copying the idea of using a figure was the idea of studying under Kevin Hogan and how he would use the figure. But getting close to the self, your own self, in terms of what, I don't know, seduces you, makes you laugh, makes you cry. You know, that, that thing that's unique, unique, uniquely ingrained in you. So through the course of time, I was doing these kind of quasi-folk art. I mean, I guess they were folk art pieces because I wasn't formally trained, you know. They're kind of screwed up folk art pieces, you know. But people are enjoying them. They're, they have a certain humorous sensibility. And I also got into, like, taking the paintings into a chainsaw sculpture kind of thing, where I'm sculpting wood into these figurative figures and then painting them, you know, through the course of time. Now, then I finally, through the course of meeting my wife over there, Karen, I uh, decided to move to California. And the whole transition of, you know, I guess I moved here in 2000, right? The transition of, like, going from one culture to the next was like, okay, where is my place in this culture? You know, how do I identify with this more pluralistic kind of setting versus a rural area such as Asheville, North Carolina? But before that happened, the last thing that happened to me was I, I worked in a factory. I worked in a factory for about 10 years, making art and working in a factory and going to school at night, get my undergraduate degree, through the course of, you know, generating a conversation or a relationship with these people at the factory that really didn't know what was going on with my art. For them, the idea of abstraction or how I approach my fears in a very expressionistic manner, there wasn't much understanding there. So a lot of times, they thought I was the oddball out. I was the eccentric one. So, as a survival kind of way of dealing with the situation, I guess I started thinking about audience. What is up with this great divide between me and the people in the factory? Why is that? You know, I was, I, you know, I was, this, I, I was just making the assumption that everyone should know about Picasso. Everyone should know about Jackson Pollock. That was my assumption. But at that stage, I started kind of like analyzing the model of art in the art world in the respect of, okay, art in itself, within the content, does evolve. It certainly does. It, you know, within the, you know, the beginning of the 20th century, Impressionism, on to now, within content, has evolved. Within technology, the conversation about cultural identity, but it's still in that same kind of model of the platform, how it's displayed. So I started thinking, okay, with the help of Lucy Lepard, who's a great theorist, and uh, a few other artists, Susie Gaplick is a good one, mapping the terrain, talking about different definitions of audience. So I started thinking about, okay, audience. 
the factory. Collaboration. <coughs> Maybe that's the way I can kind of bridge that gap if I can collaborate with these people in the factory. Maybe I can live with these people on a day-to-day -day basis so they understand a little better what I am doing with my work. So at that stage, art for, for me became more of a relational aesthetic, you know, the relationship, the aesthetic coming together. And think about how maybe, you know, the, the idea of art forms, drawing, painting, sculpting, performance art, video, can be this idea of creating relationships with the audience, integrating the audience into the work, if not that, maybe immobilizing the audience's imagination when they see the work, creating a bridge. <coughs> so, you know, for me, here we have some definitions of my work. You know, I've done video work. You, you've been in the gallery and you've seen some of the dancing crazy guys, right? Seen those guys, right? <coughs> that kind of spawned from and I guess it was in 2004, I started having a gallery in my garage, which is a two-car garage. The ceiling is about 14 feet high. And through the donations of you know, people who have been to the garage, I've gotten track lights. And it's pretty well tricked out in terms of a nice exhibition space. So we've had like a show for about every month for, you know, since two, you know, 2004. So that's like 60 shows. <laughs> in the respect of kind of trying to germinate some kind of cultural, you know, some kind of community, cultural community, in the respect of those rocks that they, you know, expounded on in such an eloquent way. Through doing that, I kind of, kind of give up me making. I was doing performance art in respect of interventions. You ever heard of an intervention? Uh, intervention is the idea of where the interventionists, there were a group of people back in the late 50s, and they would think about, okay, it's not about making objects so much, because there's so much things already existing in the world, we can think about cultural ritual, cultural settings, and we can put ourselves in those cultural settings and maybe redirect them, maybe redefine them into a different direction. And maybe, you know, that way we can circumvent the idea of commodity, economy, the where our the practical day of life is more about experience versus the commodity. You know, we live in a very commodified society in, in a lot of ways. The object being commodified. But it's really, you know, you think about it, it's the experience from the object that we take away. So how do we make the experience for everybody? So I got into doing like, I did a performance at the DMV, which was this kind of funky nightclub act, where I'd tell these funky jokes, dancing to a painting, or I'd dress up, up like Superman and I'd help people across the street, various videos. And then we did this thing, here's me and Karen, and we did a, a garage gal, which was a great thing. And it was my first really kind of experience of curating shows. You ever, anybody here, what is, what is curating anyways? What do you think? To curate a show, don't you know. She curated a show. What do you think, what is it, to curate a show? Go ahead. Just to put it all together. To put it all together, right? You know, it's the idea that you could like, you got this one idea. You might have one idea. And you have this one idea and you put it out into the world. And you see who else has a similar idea in the respect of making or action. Then you bring these ideas together and it becomes a survey of ideas in some ways. Or sometimes the garage gallery would represent <coughs> showcasing a particular artist from San Diego that maybe never had an opportunity to show their work. Maybe it's cause of content, you know, maybe because it wasn't sellable. Was it, gee, it wouldn't be that commodity. Those kind of ideas. So that was a relational aesthetic too, in the respect of bringing people together, bringing people people together, having conversations, you know, and having a decent party at least once a month for Karen and I. So over, you know, of course, of sixty shows, one at, you know, one every month. 
the final show, close to the final show, next to Alexandra's show, was the idea of an art gym. I think Richard Child Davis, is he here? Maybe he took off. But one of the last shows we had was the art gym, which is based on a similar premise of a gym. You know, you get off of work, go to the gym, work out, and you take a shower, and you go home, right? Here, you get off of work, you go to the art gym, you make some art, go take a shower, and you go home. <laughs> So, you know, at that stage, you know, I, I, I hadn't made, I hadn't painted, because I've been painting since, you know, on and off for 30 years. My guy that kind of represents me in Asheville says, you know, man, I wish you would just quit thinking about what you're making so much, because you're over-intellectualized. I wish it was just back in the day when you just make something, you know? So I got into thinking about one day at the art gym, you know, I'm going to take maybe a, a film still from this video of these old white guys that I've got dancing for me, and I'll just start painting them. The white guys is a whole different story. You know, they got the, the video you saw in the, in the gallery, the old guys dancing with the John McKay mask, right? That's another story. But it got me into painting and respect of getting back and using the figure as a narrative. The videos, they represent me in a lot of ways. You know, when I, was, I went to Vermont College to get my Master of Fine Arts, my, uh, the whole thesis of my Master of Fine Arts was the artist as a fool. The idea of the court jester, and how, how can a white guy below average size can bring anything to contemporary art to the stage where it's really, you know, today within contemporary art, it's a pluralistic setup, you know. There are other people that need their day in the sun, their day in the light, you know, in terms of these conversations. Because, you know, pretty much modernism was dictated by, you know, the white guy, the European white guy moving into America. So for me, today, within today's setting, is the idea of the fool, servitude, humility, and, you know, poking fun at politicians, Poking fun at those archetypes that we usually look up at. So that when we look at these paintings, it kind of speaks to that. And the whole project, which stems from the performance work, the Grow Man Naked Project, which is, uh, where's that come from? You ever heard that? It's, it's a punchline from a joke. Grow Man Naked. You ever heard that? Where's it from? Airplane. The movie Airplane. And then, you know, thinking about the Grown Man Naked Project, in the respect of humility, poking fun at oneself, and dancing, and dancing, these are from some of the stills from the video. This is Stepmaster Hank, who was here tonight. The videos have actually been shown all over Europe. And actually, they're, they're being rented by a few gay nightclubs in San Francisco. <laughs> yeah, right. Stepmaster Hank. Rug Cutter Ricky. That's uh, Jam Master Johnny, who couldn't make it tonight. He's uh, been pretty ill. Jam Master Johnny's a great painter. He's going to Vermont College right now to get his Master of Fine Arts. And the other day he calls me up and goes, and he's been really ill because he's got hepatitis C, he's, he's uh, bipolar and diabetic. He calls me up and goes, hey Larry, you know what? I just woke up and, uh, you know, out of a coma. <laughs> and I'm working on these pastels. I want you to real see them because they're really excited, you know? So God love them. you got to love the spirit of, you know, somebody's just like into it for the making of it. There he is again. These are on felt or uh, canvas. And you know, they're kind of, they're deconstructed in a lot of ways in the respect that, you know, they become more generalized. They become just that male dancing on a carpet. The dancing thing started off with one day, I guess I just turned 50. And I'm looking at myself and I was sick at the time. I'm like, you know, I had a little bit of a beer gut. And I'm looking, I said, well, what can I do with this? You know? 
And I've been thinking about doing some kind of dancing stuff, because I love the idea of dancing, because I've done dancing with DMV. So I put a John McCain mask on, went down in the garage, <laughs> set up the camera, and just kind of danced in front of it with the music of Neil Diamond. <laughs> and that kind of what, that's what perpetuated the whole idea. And I, you know, I got a lot of resources of these old white fat pasty guys around me too. You know, they're hanging out with me. You know, when they come to the garage, and I'm like, okay, you're perfect for this. Maybe you can come to the garage and do a dance. And so this is a depiction of uh, dancing Dan, which is really Dan Adams, who's a fabulous painter. And that's Jam Master Johnny. Very, this, this very, very various variations of the idea. Moving through that, you know, figurative, Jam Master Johnny, the idea of the mask, so, you know, the figure's a narrative. Here's actually, you know, I took a break and did a painting of this piece here, which was a performance intervention I did at the Museum of the Living Arts, where I hired two actresses to have an argument over a painting, and it ended up in an arm wrestling contest. Expressionistic, yes, it's part of it. So, you know, I've gotten, you know, it's, it's not, the painting for me. It's, it's such an intuitive thing, it kind of surpasses the idea of language, in a way. You know, but there's also different approaches to painting, that it could be either like an analog idea or a digital idea. It would be kind of like a Mondrian idea or a Jackson Pollock idea. Or like the idea of a, po a poem versus, you know, just a straight up something written, non-fiction text. Portraits started at this stage, and you know, it was uh, portraits, when I'm looking at the dancers, I'm then diffusing the faces, the portraits become like residue, like this idea of residue of somebody you might have known, in a very vague way, you know, as opposed to the, the tr traditional way of abstraction where you take that thing that's representational, that looks like something, and then you would break it down into some kind of re abstract reality, okay? For me, it became more of this kind of like a, like a biomorphic idea, where I start out this surface and, and generally start shaping it to somebody that, in a general way, was this residue of resemblance of something there, of a character, of this stranger, the stranger that I might have known. And then I would just stop. Sometimes a hard time, to, the hardest time is stopping sometimes when you get to that stage of realization. And you know, the, the juxtaposition of something very representational to something very abstract, in a lot of ways, is the formula of you know, that, that, that counterbalance and comedy in the respect of something rigid versus something folly. So, you know, I started that, I, it, you know, it was like 300 days ago, and I've made a painting every day every day. So it's like an addiction. Art is like an addiction. A whole series of them. And watercolor, you know, each medium has its, its own set of problems, problem solving. What's interesting about when these figures find their way, and they're all about males, and they're all about white males, when the clothes are removed, they, they represent a duality of sexuality in some ways. You know, I mean, there's a lot here, and I, you know, I don't want to have to go through all of them. But you know, the most current ones I'm working on are, in some ways, the, the idea of deconstructing the things that are familiar to us. 
like uh, you know, I just finished a portrait of Frank Zappa that's deconstructed. Also cartoons, but a more general way that where the the figure as it that as it narrates, it narrates in a message that's more visceral than literal. <coughs> Superman. Oh, this one. Now. I'm working out this Superman piece, right? Because I love Superman. He's part of my culture. You know, he's, he's part of who I am. And, uh, you know, in doing a portrait of him, and this is a biomorphic exercise where you pretty much respond to a surface, you respond to a shape, and it directs you in terms of the overall realization. So it wasn't until after the fact that somebody mentioned to me, well, that kind of looks like Santa Claus. I'm like, okay, score, bonus. But it is this, this idea of Santa Claus. And the idea of, you know, audience, which takes me into Facebook. Who has a Facebook account? All right? It is the social media. For me, in the, the idea of relational aesthetic at this stage of my life is the use of Facebook. It's also the idea of vulnerability where as soon as I make something, I, whether it's, you know, I think it's done or not, I'm posting it and letting other people see it. Along with showing them my cat, or what me and my nephew's done lately, pictures of my wife. They're all equal. They're all equal in my life. So in the course of people seeing these pictures on Facebook, I'm getting all these voices all these responses. And those responses inform my writing. They become, in addition to Francis Bacon, Jackson Pollock, people I admire, voices in my head as well as I approach the canvas. Social media. You know, it's, it's a, kind of a new idea of audience. They're all over the world. They look at my work and they buy my work. I'm, getting, I'm writing at collectors at this stage through the course of not necessarily going through a gallery, but having an exchange of talking about the work and, the, and them seeing the progression of the work. You know, and it's, it's, it's a vulnerable situation because for the most part, we're accustomed as artists to suspend belief, to put our best work out there, you know, and create a facade of self. But by putting everything out there, you know, you kind of like reveal process. You reveal the process of making in a lot of ways. This is a very vulnerable way of going about doing it. But it's been very rewarding in respect of, you know, just generating all these, you know, conversations about the work and, you know, and responses. And responses that inform the work, the actual making of the work, but also writing about the work as well. So that's kind of like where I'm at right now, thinking about that. And also, you know, it's also, you know, making art, it's about sustainability, and if you guys are into making art, you know, you got to think about why you're doing it, you know. Don't think about the usual model. Think about where you fit in, why you're making it, you know. I mean, that sounds kind of like, that sounds kind of hokey, but you really got to find out where you do fit in, because the, the usual model might not fit you in. And really, art is just, in the spirit of Joseph Boys, you ever heard of Joseph Boys? Right? Everybody's an artist. Everybody that's born under the sun is an artist. You've you got to find your way to sustain yourself. Like the graffiti artists. A graffiti artist might not have a studio. You know, they might ha not have a gallery. But they're going to make art anyways. And maybe that's what's pushed them out into the world. And by being pushed out into the world, new realizations take place. Right? Sometimes it's a, it's a system of economics that these new realizations, these this fresh ideas, take place. Okay, so the, you know it's uh, it's it's more of a it's not it's not a careerist thing. It can be a careerist thing. Don't reject that. Don't reject that. Live on the fringe. Go back and forth. Whatever suits your purpose of making, you know, that sustains you as a maker. You'll use that. Okay? All right, that's like I said.
Okay, so you've heard of three artists, you know, three um, descriptions of how they work, you know, what inspires them, what they're passionate about, not only their process and what they make, but also things sometimes related but outside, you know, Chris with Space for Art and, you know, Larry with um, his curatorial project and, you know, uh, Silfredo with his dance. Um, and so, do you guys have any questions for, for any of them? Um, why not the face? Why, just, why did you put the face in the painting? It makes it kind of more open-ended in terms of like you looking at it, maybe you can interpret that, you, you can interpret it and maybe see somebody that you're, you recognize, you know, it makes it more generalized in some ways, you know. And that's a, that's a tough one, you know, because uh, because usually it's the figure that points to that particular, you know what I mean? It does. So you, making that kind of like that bridge between something very abstract and figurative, it's kind of like a test doing that, you know, where th there is that kind of resemblance, or maybe you become that figure by your own projection of it in some ways. You know, I used to have a portrait company, and I used to make portraits, you know, <laughs> on the side for money. So I know the, the formalistic skills of it, you know? So it's a different approach to it. It's a more general way of like saying this is that person. And sometimes the signifier or the thing that identifies the person within a, a say, a, a, a structure, you know, a class structure with, or within society, okay? is maybe what they're wearing. That you'll say, okay, you've got that kind of tie to that shirt you're within that area of community, maybe, that kind of idea. Does that make sense? Okay. I, I want to say something about that, because uh, <laughs> it's funny, because you were talking about comedy, and then um, when I was looking at all this, like, whatever, you know, distorted faces, they all look like portraits of people that have uh, been been pied in the face. Oh. You know? <laughs> yeah. Like, 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 like almost all of them do. I wondered if, yeah. if you were into, like, the Three Stooges, or... Well, it's funny you said that because I was watching some old YouTube videos the other day of, you know, of Mo, you know, the, the three stooges, and he was on the, I think it was the Dick Cavett show, and he was the only one remaining stooge, I think, and his old skit was throwing pies. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, not on a conscious level, right, 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 right. but there's something there that you know, needs to be explored <laughs> with the pie thing, definitely, definitely, you know. I also wonder, I mean, it's some explanation that I made up, I guess, but when I was looking at those faces, as another student asked me about this idea that you're doing this kind of, in a way, a critique of the, although it's playful, of the white male, you know, as a oh, gesture. Oh, it's definitely that. And so by yeah. this face is actually kind of dissolving or, you know, kind of some sort of transformation, evaporation of the faces. Yeah. To me, it's by, through, the, through the paint media, through the acrylic, you know, that this, faces are actually just becoming maybe nothing, you know. Uh, but although you still have the, the body yeah. and the and the attributes, you know, the ties yeah. and the suits and the other things. I don't know. There's a great book you guys should read by uh, Giles Deleuze. Giles Deleuze, okay? And he talks about Francis Bacon. And Francis Bacon in the respect of, uh, you know, the figure as not a narrative but something visceral that communicates on a different level. You know, like how when you're in nature, how it communicates to you. It's not about language, okay? And he makes the distinction between the idea of something analog versus digital, which kind of goes into that conversation. And so it's kind of like the emotional response that you see from that pie in the face, or that mesh of a color, that kind of idea. You know, color being an uh, icon or you know, having its psychological meaning when you see it, and in what shape does it present itself within the form of the face, you know, and you put those together, you know, and it becomes some kind of a weird identity in some ways. So not a question, but how about a response <laughs> instead of a question? Oh. I'm a newer painter, and I also like doing abstract figurative art, and often the response that I, and I used to be a dancer, the often the response I get, because I'm newer, is you should do this. Maybe I don't like it this way. I draw faceless females in silhouettes, oh. monochromatic. And I'm always getting 
told how to make it the way to conform, I guess. Oh, and so to other hearing, people's work. Yes. Oh. And so hearing you, though, makes me feel better about my stance on, no, I want the women to be faceless. And I don't want their bodies to have details. Mm. I just want the, the basic form. And so right. I'm right. feeling better about being a nonconformist. Well, good. <laughs> yeah, sure. There's a question. I think when she was just speaking, um, it was a lot like what you were saying. You were just testing back there in the museum. Mm -hmm. And about art touching, how it touches someone when they're looking at the art and that, and being aware and that. And I think that it's very important as an artist or human, no matter what you're doing in life, um, that you do what you feel is best and what you feel is right. And um, therefore, you, I mean, then you have that joy in your life and you will always feel right about what you're doing and all. And that's why when we were talking, I connected because of the fact that I felt that joy in your work and I wanted to almost just touch it and I could see that you were building upon it. I felt also, I, I knew, I felt a connection to yours also in different ways too. I felt it because of the, the movement in different ways and stuff too. But it's important, I think, for when she said that, that it's a lot what we talked about. Yeah. It's not, it's important to be aware of who you are, and that's what you were saying. And and somehow it does then somehow connect with other people. What what greater thing can you have in life than as an artist be able to connect with others? And something you've done that's really truly who you are. I mean, that's mm -hmm. the most beautiful thing in the world. That all have done that in a lot of ways, and I really appreciate having been here this evening and seeing your work and, and everything. I'm very appreciative of it, and I've listened to you all speak tonight also. Okay. Okay. Okay, a question for uh, Alfredo. Yes. Um, so when I, uh, you know, when I went to the gallery and I saw the paintings, you know, I, I kind of went through everything really quickly and I looked at it and, you know, I didn't have much insight into it. And then when I saw you explain, um, you know, your process, it was kind of like I had a new kind of appreciation for it. Like as far as like, when you have the painting there, it's like the result of the moment because you were, you know, you're, you're dancing and you had music and, and uh, all that behind it, but then in the end, you know, go to the gallery, you just see the painting of that moment of what you were feeling at the time. Now, do you kind of think of it as like that painting is like that moment in time that everybody gets to see, but the part of you making it is kind of more like for yourself, like you're just kind of in the moment and that's just for yourself? Because if people saw you, do, I mean, I don't know if you do stuff like that in public. Or I do, I do, I do, I do perform in public. I decided this time not to do it because I was just coming from from my uh, from my <laughs> class of Palomar College, and I was just running to to the. But I do, I do perform. And ex, yeah, but what I do when I paint in my studio, yes, yes, by myself. Yes, like it's my day, it's my time. I, I want to spread myself. <laughs> And um, when I show my art, so people will have a different idea. So, complete different idea of what I was thinking at that time. And if it that fit, that's true. I mean, for them, that's great. <coughs> I explained to them what I was doing at that time. And um, they say, oh, but what I see here, yes, uh, I saw the painting a year ago that was a, I call it a red, a red warrior. And I was just like a fighting them in my studio. You know what I mean? A lot of red and thing and spear and thing. And when I saw the painting, the guy who bought it, he saw like a, a French, a French guy drinking something. <laughs> 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 and that's why he bought it. <laughs> yeah. And he said, yeah, but you see the warrior? <laughs> <No. laughs> I saw a French guy drinking, and he bought it because he, 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 that's what he saw. 
and it's I say great. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, when I'm painting, I'm not. I'm just just by myself, and when I explain to people, it might be not make any sense for them, but <coughs> I'm willing I mean, to explain it, and if you doubt, video is just so. Uh, it's not really that much of a commodity, you know, and it, with especially with like YouTube and uh, and j like the internet, it's like everything is out there, you know. Like like, I mean, you think about like creating, you put it on this disc, and then it's like, uh, I mean, unless you're creating a video on like 16 millimeter film and you have the only reel, you know, then that thing is worth something. But like this thing that's that is so repeatable. And um, and also just so non-archival, like the, those DVDs, like they just break down right away. So I mean, I think that it, you can. I mean, you obviously can sell video work, but I don't think that it makes it any more necessarily any more of, of a commodity. It's still pretty ephemeral in a way. And I, I mean, to answer your question, I never really felt a pressure to do that. I think that my only impetus in making video work was just a different way to think about the audience and and using time uh, like a like a medium like I would use paint or you know or any kind of sculpture material. Oh, there's what here, man. Um, I had a question, uh, kind of battle name. Sorry uh, for you. Mm -hmm. um, you said that your art changed uh, from when you left school to when you got out. Mm -hmm. Was that transition due? to that network that was missing there from all the students being in there or was it because of the restrictions of having to, having to do certain projects as opposed to your free to create whatever you want? Yeah, all of that. Um, yeah, it had to do with, well, I, I don't think it had to do with not having a <laughs> network because that got, cre I kind of created that pretty fast, luckily. I had a few people around me. Um, I stayed in touch with people from from school, and <laughs> that were also really serious about making work. So that kind of network I had, I didn't have deadlines, but um, but it changed because yeah, because of the lack of of having a specific context to make work towards, and you know, like you when you're in school, and and you get you you're in a certain class, and sometimes like you take classes, and you have the same students in the same class, so your your peer group is pretty small. And those are the people that are responding. That's your audience too. You know, they're your friends, but they're also your audience when you're in school. And you get out, and all of a sudden, it's just wide open, and, and um, you realize that there's a lot more feedback that you can get. So I think that it was like, it was about kind of getting into a place that was more open. And yeah, like like less. There wasn't as many assignments, for sure. But uh, but I but I think it was also just just feeling like the world was wide open and that I could do anything, you know? So I noticed that you all use, um, at some point, non-conventional materials. Um, so right with the roofing yep. uh, and wood, like large pieces of wood, and then you have felt, and also you have, you have a wide range of different <laughs> materials. And so I wanted to know, are the materials just, here's what I had, or, and I'm using it, or is it, you know, does it ha add to your work? Well, the felt thing was basically I ran out of canvas. <laughs> <laughs> and I had this big sheet of felt over the garage door to keep the lights up. We had a video night. So I said, well, I'll try that, you know, and uh, it ended up being, combination of canvas and watercolor paper within the surface treatment, the tooth of it, you know, so I really love it, using that, it's very practical, you know, um, so that's... It was the lighter, lightest load of art that I've ever transported. It's very light. He gave very me like a hundred paintings, I just carried yeah. them into my car. <laughs> no storage problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For me it's a mix of things. It's a mix of, 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 that's what I have now. Um, I go to Home Depot, that's my favorite store. <laughs> <laughs> trying to find something here to express myself. But it's a mix, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I just love 
different materials. And I love the challenge of something that um, that I don't really know how to work with, and sort of like just haphazardly trying things. And the video was was like that, you know. Like I said, like literally, it's clicking, just clicking the mouse and seeing what happened. And um, and then I love just grabbing some new material that I don't really know how to use and struggling with it and trying to figure out something because sometimes when you get a little bit, you get more control over a medium, you, you tend to, to baby it a little bit and you tend to, to lose some of the immediacy that, that you gain when, and uh, like uh, I think in my first painting teacher called it like happy accidents or whatever. Um, but uh, but I mean I think that speaks to something larger about just kind of problem solving, you know, and uh, and and also I like it when the material pushes back against me. When I have a will for it to do something, and I'm like, I want you to do this, and it's like, no, I'm not going to quite do that. And then it's like, okay, well, then we're going to have to come to some kind of compromise here. <laughs> and and so it's like it's like the material is working equally as, as hard as me, and then what we get is this total unexpected result. That's probably better than what I, I intended. So that's why I use so many different materials. Um, I, I, I choose the roofing because I couldn't, uh, I was performing at that time on the audience. Um, it was kind of slippery, it was my favorite performance, it was kind of slippery, the, the canvas. So I said, you know what, I cannot, I don't want to fall down from the public. And I want to be in the sound and boom, just be there on the floor. And I went to Home Depot, we just like walking, 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 and until I saw this roll of proofing, I opened it up from Home Depot, and I turned down with my shoes, and I found him, yeah, this and I want to fall down. And then I just, you know I mean, I bought the whole thing like a $60, I used just that like piece. And then I went to, and I do my first piece on my show. <laughs> it's really simple. You see, you see the piece, it's really simple because I noticed that, that, that with the canvas too, that, that every time that you step, the canvas got messed up really quickly. Really quickly, we just like, I'm done. And with the roofing, we just like, you cannot spray the, 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 the painting everywhere. You know what I mean? You can walk and the painting will just like, I'm not going anywhere, so I was just using more like uh, um, I discovered that, so that having done any, any other roofing, yeah. Uh, it's good to experiment like that. Yeah. It takes you into these areas that, like it says, presents interesting problems, and then, then, and then and that it doesn't just yield itself to you, that can take you into that interesting direction <laughs> you hadn't considered, you know? So it's explorative, the idea. And then when you do explore those ideas, maybe it's the idea of turning back and saying, okay, I've got to translate these, these ideas into more traditional means. You know? So it feeds off of each other, back and forth, back and forth. So it's good just to go out there and, you know, I used to you know, use a lot of film stuff. You know? Took me into paper making at one stage. So you never know. The fact that there is that resist, like you said, is that, uh, that new realities come kind of spring forth. That it doesn't totally succumb to your domination. I'm, we've looked at a lot of artwork um, this evening, and there's something so compelling and intimate and vulnerable and courageous about the fact that there are so many singular figures in each one of the works. And we're hearing from you this this it's necessary for you to work within a community. You're talking about the art gym and a, a kind of collaborative, certainly the, the garage has that. Yeah. I, I'm kind of interested in these singular images and then the sense of community. And I'm wondering if there's anything, uh, certainly the, the viewers engage with the work, but do you do anything where you are working um, in the process and engaging with uh, anyone else? I, I'm, I'm in the process of that. I'm trying to create like a, a serious painting, but it's, it's, it's a big, big project. <laughs> and it's, it's a video performing and <coughs> painting. So it's about just going to a Cuban, my Cuban community and doing like a, a film to a family, like a, like, like a, 
asking them <coughs> how they come from Cuba, if they come in a raft or flying or whatever, and how they made it here in the United States. So I have this video, and I will be creating a painting with that purpose, with, the, with, that, with that story. So I'll be creating a painting with that story, and then I'll be putting together that video, I will put it together my video of creating the painting and creating just one single video. So by the end, of, I will be have a video of the, of, the, of, the, of the story of the family, but also I will be having a painting. So I'm working on working, I'm, 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 see, I'm working on, on trying to, to get in touch with that community, with my human community, and creating that type of work. Not just painting or just in my, but working with other, 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 uh, like I said, you know what I mean? Try to navigate myself and create a different, different type of. Uh, I, I guess I was also wondering too, you mentioned the, um, Formal dance training, which uh -huh. would have been a, a collective experience, I'm, I'm guessing. Yeah. With the ballet, of course? Yeah, no, yeah. not ballet. It's, I took ballet class, but more like modern dance. Like modern? Oh, modern. Yeah, modern dance, yes. But that was more a, a, a class, a shared class or something. Do you continue that practice? I I don't do it like, like I teach it sometimes. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't dance it professionally with any company. But I do teach it, and if I have to dance it, I will give myself like a two weeks on my house, just yes, like training. So um, I'll be, I'll be good. Yeah. Um, I have a question for Sofredo. Yeah. Uh, you talked about always wanting to keep working on a painting. Uh, how do you know when, like, when your painting is done? How long do you usually take on a work? You know. Something that I find out with my work, like I said, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm very new to working my baby step on painting. It's like a, on my first painting, when I start doing it, I, I thought, oh man, that was great thing. A month back, and I didn't like it all. And then I create something really <coughs> good, and two months back, and I didn't like it. So it, really, it was really hard to please myself what I like. And um, on the process of the painting, it happened the same, the same, same thing, you know what I mean? I, for me, painting is like a, I don't know what it is. It's just, it's just something that, that, it's a white canvas, it's whatever, and it's just me and, and the painting, and we have a relationship, and we have to create something. So we, I talk a lot to the painting, to the time that when I see the painting, she said, oh, I don't want, I don't want you to touch me anymore. And I got that, so I don't touch it. <laughs> you know what I mean? I just like, 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 like. <laughs> I don't do it. But I come to, maybe come three months later, and I don't like it. And it need to be touched. And that painting that was created, and I really like it at the time, three months from now, I will paint over it. I mean, um, I will not hear it, actually. <laughs> yeah, I cannot. <laughs> well, yeah, you're, you're filtering so many things in your life, you know, so many things that influence you and that interpretation of that thing that reflects that life, you know? So it's, it's just so, uh, you know, it's circumstantial, it's situational, you know, there's no formula to it. For me, you know, it's reflective because I'm so old <laughs> and I'm getting older and it's a, there's that, you know, that looking back and reflecting a lot, you know, and then retranslating that. And there are some projection there too, so you know. And uh, and I think your, your your observation of the singular person is very interesting because in some ways these are very autobiographical. You know, it's me projecting whether it's Nixon or Superman, me into that and relating to that in some level. You know, justifying that in some level, rationalizing. It. So, yeah. I mean, I even did a video series about people rationalizing various historical people. Like I did Robert Oppenheimer and why he did the things he did, you know, and, uh, putting myself in his shoes and that kind of projection idea. So yeah, it's, I mean, we think about it all the time, don't we? I mean, we all live that, that kind of idea day to day, that kind of reflection, thinking about our place in the world and where we fit and how do we project and how people see us, you know, our perceptions. And, and 
maybe maintaining a certain facade too. The facade is a very important thing too to think about. You know, the socialized mask that we carry around with us all the time. And what what does that present? <laughs> What community, what kind of audience, you know? And because, uh, you know, some of the best actors, there's that, that vacancy that really fits those various masks, you know, that they, that they can really exercise well. I have one question for Chris. You were talking about the, um, you know, impressionist equalities of some of the sculptures and the portraits. But then I was also really intrigued by the video work and um, to me it looked a lot of influenced by cubism yeah mm. and you know Guernica and I could see in terms of the shapes and this idea of poking the holes through and seeing through and different layer and I just was wondering if there was some interest yeah. in that yeah 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 so there's there's a lot of different art historical references I think impressionism was just like that was the first thing I was influenced by um, in terms of our history, but but uh, definitely uh, like studying cubism, Picasso and Brock have been like a huge influence on those video works. Also, the uh, the uh, Queen figure in the in the gallery, I think, um, is very influenced by that stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I kind of think also. Like uh, Duchamp's new descending the staircase. Mm -hmm. For some reason, when I look at the video work, I think about that. And the, in both the face, uh, the face, but also the seated figure. Yeah, you know, I think of those. Yeah, and that fractured quality, and also, I mean, just collage um, in general. You know, which is also kind of coming out of uh, out of cubism. Um, but uh, but collage was it was. I mean, I view those things as just total collage works. I just happened to notice that portrait you did when you were in, was it high school? Self portrait? Uh huh. Yeah, I was like, I think it was my, I think it was in community college, but yeah. Yeah, that has a lot of, like, I'm a teacher and our, our artist of the month is Van Gogh, and I actually have one of Van Gogh's self portraits hanging up in the classroom, and it looks a lot alike, mm -hmm. the portrait. And, you know, the one where he has bandages on yeah. his ear. Yeah, I'm trying to look like him right now. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, yeah. I think I, I did a lot of self portraits. I mean, even when I was like a, a kid, I would do self portraits. Like, I wanted to be like a cowboy, and I would just like draw myself, like draw my face in the mirror, and then um, and then draw like like a cowboy around that, you know. And then um, I mean, when I was like starting to get into painting, I mean, I didn't really know a lot about art history. I didn't know anything, but I didn't know Van Gogh because it's like almost everybody does. So I saw that stuff, and I and I did kind of emulate those those portraits, and I didn't even um, really think that I looked a lot of like him. Like him, but then but but teachers would say that to me too. They'd be like, "This looks like Van Gogh." <laughs> Well, just um, the seriousness too of, mm -hmm. of your face, and, and that was very typical for Van Gogh too. Was he did his portraits? He never did one with someone smiling, all cheerful. They were all very yeah, yeah, serious. Yeah, and there's also like he uses a lot of color, but it's but he uses it in a way that's like actually disturbing, mm -hmm. you know. And that's I think that's a big influence on my work, where it's like these bright things, but um, but yet if you get a certain combination, it it can actually uh, it can actually lead you into into something in a different direction, and I think that those are all just like tools, like like the same thing with comedy and different things like that. They they sort of lift the guard, I feel like, of of the viewer, and and are able to like connect. It makes it easier to connect to it emotionally when it, when there's something unexpected. So. For Chris, um, just. Are your collaging videos available online anywhere? Yeah, they're on. Uh, I've got a, a couple of them up on uh, Vimeo, so it's vimeo.com slash Chris War. Well, I have tons of questions for you guys, but I don't think we will want to stay for hours. But mm -hmm. I just, you know, the more I hear you speak, the more 
connections I see, the va you know, how you go all value the accident, you know, as part of mm -hmm. your work, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and that's important, and you know, they, they, this, this singular yet important of the collective, you know, in your works, the, which Georgia mentioned, the performative aspect, you know, I just, I just think we should do a performance where you sit in the gallery and we come and ask you questions or something. Yeah. Do that? That'd be great. <laughs> love to do that. Yeah. Maybe, that we, maybe we should do a lunch. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. maybe we should do a lunch with the artists, you know, as a follow-up. It might be kind of fun. But you guys have any any other questions or comments? Yes, thank you. Very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.